in week four of a series that we kicked off called Brand New. And every week we've kind of talked about the main idea of this whole series to kind of remind us, and we're going to put it up on the screen, and it's this. Despite all the new that we've created and all the new that we've discovered, humanity has the same old problems. The reality is, is the world that you and I live in, it is busted and it is broken. You just have to watch the news. You just have to go into Instagram or Facebook. You just have to live and be over seven years old and you know that the same old happens. Listen, and this is despite all the new technology we've created, despite all the new medical advances, despite all the new politics and the, the new economies that we've created and the new education system and even the new social norms, we have the same old problems. And we were going, well, why do we have the same old problems? And here's what we discovered. It's not the new that's the problem. It's the old that we bring with us. And we've been saying this for a couple weeks. And here's the next slide. Is we are held back. You are held back. I'm held back. We're all held back by what we hold on to. And we spent the first three weeks talking about this old that we hold on to. And so I want to say something. If this is your first Sunday, whether you're at Lusby or whether you're here at Leonardtown or whether you're watching online, really want to encourage you and go back and watch weeks one, two, and three, and you can catch up on our YouTube channel or on our website. I encourage you to do that. But here's the great news. Here's the great news is Jesus came to bring something brand new. And listen, whenever I say Jesus, Jesus didn't come to bring and put a new paint job or new rims on old religion. No, Jesus came to do something totally brand new. And here's what Jesus came. Jesus came to bring a brand new way. Jesus brought a brand new command, a brand new expression, and a brand new community. This wasn't Jewish religion 2.0. This isn't any kind of religion that Jesus is just putting a fresh coat of paint on. No, no, no. Jesus came to do something very brand new. Matter of fact, this brand new is scandalous. And when I tell you why it's scandalous in a little bit, you'll see why. But I want to remind us of something, and you might be thinking, well, the world may need something brand new, and I know this to be true, that there was a season in my life and this might be shocking for those of you that don't know me personally, where I was in desperate need of brand new. If I told you my story, you would discover that I came from a broken home. My parents were divorced not once, but twice. We lived in government housing. By the age of five or six, I had been abused by my stepdad physically and emotionally. My mom died when I was nine years old. She took her own life. I got sent to a Christian counselor who abused me. I was sexually active by the age of 11. I was in juvenile detention by the age of 12. I broke into my first house looking to steal a gun, and when I couldn't find the gun, I stole explosives and set it off on a railroad track, and thank God I didn't kill anyone. I used to drink. Smoke and huff anything to stay high, to avoid the pain that lived inside of me. Matter of fact, I used to steal, before my 15th birthday when I was incarcerated, we used to sneak into the office complex and steal whiteout. Even though we knew that whiteout had killed other kids, we used to put it in a plastic bag and huff it. I'm surprised I'm still alive. And a ton of other things that I've done that I'll never say from up front. And then I was homeless at 17 without a mom, without a dad, and I could carry every single belonging I owned in a hamper. If there was ever anyone in this world that needed new, it was me. And then I walked into a church, and it was a church a lot like this one. It met in a school, and it was for everyday people, and they talked about Jesus in a way that made sense. And to be honest, I was really interested in Jesus. I really wasn't interested in religion, but Jesus, there's something about Jesus. And to be honest with you, I was scared, and I wasn't scared to follow Jesus because of the things that I would have to give up. Listen, I did all the things that people told me would bring life. I did all those things, and I knew the truth that they were hollow and empty. Yes, they brought pleasure, but they didn't bring life. I wasn't scared to give up things. I'll tell you the thing that I feared the most. Here's what I feared the most about following Jesus is that I would be a fake. Because there's no one on this planet that knows me better than me. You see, I grew up 
making dumb and destructive decisions. All the counselors and all the people when I was locked up, you know what they would say about me? They would look at me at my face and they say, Matt, you won't live to see 18. And if you live to see 18, you won't see it outside the four walls of a prison. I was in desperate need of something brand new. And I knew that if I wanted to say yes to Jesus, that I didn't want to wear a costume called Christianity. I didn't want to wear a costume on the outside where I was fake. No, 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 no. I knew who I was on the inside, and I was a busted and broken and flawed human being. I needed something on the inside. And it got me thinking. If I was a betting man, which I'm not, I can't afford to be. That you aren't looking to wear a costume called Christianity. That if you're here or watching or at our campus, that you don't want to wear a costume of Christianity. What you really want is to be changed from the inside out. You've done the thing that told you you would be full and satisfied if you consumed and accomplished. And you want a costume for the hollowness on the inside. You want to be full on the inside. As you try to parent and get through life and realize maybe you don't have all that it takes to be a parent because it is the hardest thing that you'll ever do. You don't want to put on a costume. What you want to do is you want to be changed on the inside. If you have an addiction that you know is destroying your life and the life of others, you don't want to put on a costume of religion. You want to be changed on the inside. If you have a flaw in your relationships and you keep moving from relationship to relationship to relationship, you don't want to dress up in disguise. You want something to be fixed on the inside. If there's a part of you that is broken and willing to benefit at the expense of others because of your poor choices, you don't want to dress that. You don't want to put a costume on. You want to be changed. Which leads us to a truth that whether you're here today and you have no faith, or you grew up in a different faith, or you came today and you grew up as a follower of Jesus going to church, this is a truth that I believe all of us want. We don't want to dress up our faults. We want to be different people. We don't want to put on a costume. Halloween was this week, and no one wants to wear the costume of Christianity. We don't want to dress up our stuff. We actually want to be different people from the inside. And here is the most amazing news. This is why we sing. This is why we raise our hands. This is why we're fired up when we sing. This is why when we get up every morning, we should smile. This is why you should be fired up on Sundays. This is the very problem that Jesus came to address. This is the brand new that Jesus came to solve. God God knew that you and I were scared. We wouldn't want to settle for the costume of religion or Christianity, that we'd want real change from the inside out. And he did what we couldn't. Because if we all mid in a truth, and here's the truth, if humanity could have solved this, we would have already done it. We've been around for a while. And if we're really honest, most of us have all grown up in the same old thing called behavior modification. It's where we fake it on the outside no matter how crazy we are on the inside. Can I get an Amen. And if you expect to come to church and not see crazy people, go somewhere else. But God knew that all we could do is really dress up the outside, that we really couldn't change the inside. And there's this encounter with Jesus. There's this encounter Jesus has with someone that is life-changing and altering. It came with someone that nobody expected him to in interact with. It was in a place nobody expected him to be. And I think it is one of the most beautiful pictures of Jesus engaging someone in almost all of the Bible. And it answers this question, how do we not dress up, but how do we actually become different people? And this encounter comes... After Jesus has been an amazing human being, he's healed people, he's loved people, he's been pure, he's been good. He's gone through four different trials. He went to a trial of the father-in-law of the high priest. And then he went to this religious group and they found him innocent. They finally put him before Pilate and he was found innocent. They took him to Herod and he was found innocent. He went through four different trials, was innocent on every account and he was unjustly condemned. He was betrayed and abandoned, tortured, and then given a death sentence. And he's surrounded by two thieves. He's dying a criminal's 
death. And in that moment, we see Jesus have one of the most unlikely encounters. And I would also say maybe it's one of the most scandalous encounters that you'll ever read in the Bible. And so we're going to pick it up in the eyewitness account of the Gospel of Luke. We see this. It says, one of the criminals was hanging behind him, scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. Now I want to stop here. You need to understand something about the criminal that was hanging on the cross. He had two of them. That all the criminals were typically um, punished in their local area. Wherever you were from, they would send you back to the place that you were and they would render judgment. And being crucified, just so you know, was the worst punishment. It was a capital punishment. Matter of fact, crucifixion was so cruel, so painful, that Roman citizens couldn't get the death penalty by crucifixion. Only people who weren't Roman citizens. So this criminal had grown up, he was from this era, he knew Jesus, and he had heard that Jesus was the Messiah. And he was kind of hoping, hey, you're in the same spot as me. Tell you what, I'll follow you if you get me out of this jam. Sound familiar? He's been in me mode his whole life, and me mode got him capital punishment. And he's still in me mode when he says, hey, Jesus, can you get us out? And what's amazing is Jesus doesn't even respond. The thief on the other cross responds. And here's what he says. But the other criminal protested. Do you not fear God even when you have been sentenced to to die? We deserve to die for our crimes. And what he's basically admitting is, listen, I've lived my life in me mode. I've lived my life in me mode regardless of the cost and the expense of everyone else. And it's got me capital punishment. I know for a fact that I actually deserve to be here. Let's not pretend that we don't deserve, right? We're getting exactly what we deserved. But then it's shocking. Listen to what he says. We deserve desire for our crimes, but this man has done, hasn't done anything wrong. Here's a thief who grew up in this community, this person who had lived in the area of Jesus, who knew the underbelly of his community. He was in touch with all the criminals. He was in capital punishment. If there was anything awkward about Jesus, he would have known it. And here he is for the fifth time, someone confirming that Jesus was innocent. And then one of the most amazing interactions in all of history takes place in a few sentences. Then he said... Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So he admits that he's guilty. He admits that Jesus is the king. He's the Messiah. He's God's son who came to fix it. And he doesn't even, he just says, would you remember me? Could you show, show me mercy? And a sentence that is scandalous, that has shaken humanity and history for thousands of years. And Jesus replied, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. Wait a second, Jesus. This guy is dying. Uh, He doesn't have time to get baptized. Hey, Jesus, whoa, 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 whoa. He doesn't have time to go to church. Hey, whoa, 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 Jesus, he hasn't time to get a WWJD bracelet or put a little fish on the back of his car or listen to Christian music or show up at church or put something in the offering or serve or do anything good. Whoa, 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 Jesus, don't you know that he has nothing to offer? He can't earn it. And yet Jesus utters these words that are scandalous. Today, you get to be with your heavenly father. You are adopted back into the family. And you didn't have to do. Now, if this man, this criminal, who was dying on the cross, had it hurt you and stolen from you or killed your family member, you would be furious. Where's the justice? He even admits that he's getting what he deserves. Where's the justice? Well, the justice comes from the innocent one right beside him. Paying the penalty. This is how we experience change from the inside out. This morning, I want to make three true observations that I think if we see clearly, we'll have the ability for anyone to not have to dress up and put on the costume of Christianity, but to actually experience change from the inside out. 
And here's the first observation that we see from this example. What happens is at the heart of the matter is our heart. Get it? It's a bug. Get it? At the heart of the matter is our heart. What's wrong is the aim of a heart. You remember last week we talked about this. We said, when we decide what's best, we'll always decide what's best for us. See, the problem is, is that our natural default position is that we aim our life as all about me, myself, and I, regardless of the cost of others. That's why when you hear the word sin, you may be offended, but don't you know, just sin means you have the wrong aim. Jesus says, listen, what shows up on the outside always comes from the and that's not my words. Let's look at the words of Jesus. We're going to put it up on the screen. The eyewitness account of the gospel of Matthew. It says, from the, Jesus says, from the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. These are what defile you. Eating with unwashed hands will never defile you. He was talking to the religious leaders and says, it doesn't matter whether you keep your hands down at worship or you raise your hands in worship, whether you read the NIV or the King James Version or whether you wear a suit and tie to church. He says, it is not the religious rituals and rules you follow on the outside. It's what's going on with your he said, the problem is that what's on the inside will always come out on the outside. And the problem is what's broken in the world is just a revealing of what is gone wrong on the inside. And the two thieves displayed this. One was in me mode his whole life. Me, me, me. I don't care what it costs you. I don't care who I hurt as long as I benefit. And he even tried to get Jesus to buy into the deal. And if we are really honest, isn't that what religion is? We're in me mode, and what we really want is to give God something that he doesn't want so that he'll bless up so we can continue to do what it is that we want to do. But the other thief realized that me mode, putting me first, and seeking what I want is what's wrong with the world. And he admitted it to Jesus. I'm guilty. I put myself first all the time. And here's what's amazing, is that you and I aren't meant to put or be in me mode. The aim of our heart was never supposed to be all about us. You see, we were created to be in a relationship with our heavenly father. What was supposed to be at the core of who we are is God, not self first. And when we put and go into me mode and put self first, the world is busted and broken. And if I was honest, this is the thing I struggle with the most. True example, it happened about two years ago. I have an adopted dad. When I was homeless, there was a couple that took me in. They became my adopted mom and dad. They never adopted me legally or anything. Everything they did, they did out of the love of their heart. I call them my adopted mom and dad. But a couple years ago, my adopted dad paid for a once-in-a-lifetime vacation. Uh, so you can't get adopted into my family. I'm sorry, we're full, right? So, so anyway, uh, my dad um, did this thing. He says, listen, I'm going to take the whole family and all the grandkids to, to Disney World, um, and, and he was going to pay for it. And it was awesome. We, got, we stayed there for like three or four days. The whole family came. It was like a family reunion. Um, and it was over Thanksgiving. And part of the gift was that on Thanksgiving Day that we would have Thanksgiving dinner in Cinderella's castle, you know, where all the, the princesses come. And we would have it. It was awesome. It was great. We stayed in a place where we could touch the giraffe and say, it was awesome. It was great. I love being a part of my adopted family. And uh, so anyway, um, on Thanksgiving Day, we all had to meet at this castle early. So we met at the castle, and I went up there to go, hey, um, our whole family's ready. And we had a bunch of kids, and it was just, it was chaos. There's 18 of us, okay? And so it was chaotic with a bunch of little kids, 18 of us. So I went up to the table and said, hey, there's our parties here. It's 18 kids. We want to have this, this family thing. And, and the person looked at me like we were crazy. I said, yes, I understand. We're a big family. We have 18 people. Just stop looking at me weird, and can you, can you seat us, right? And so he said, hey, listen, I need to let you know something. Um, we can't seat 18. The, the way the room is designed because it's a castle, it's not like a giant square, you're going to have to sit in little individual tables. Um, and so you have to kind of, I think the biggest table they had was a six and so four tops. And they said, well, how do you want to divvy up? And in that moment, I knew that what I should have done was taken my sister and my brother-in-law who flew all the way over from Scotland. They have two kids. I should have put them at the table with my dad. But I didn't do that because I don't get to see my dad very often. I wanted to be with my dad. I wanted my kids to be with my dad. And so in a moment, I I went into me mode, and I did what was best for me. And I remember sitting at the table looking around my family going, man, I messed this up. 
Because when we decide what is best, we always decide what is best for us. Our aim is wrong when it's all about us. And at the heart of the matter is our heart, which leaves us, well, how do you change a heart? Which leads us to observation number two, which is so brand new. This is what is so, this is what is so scandalous. Grace is an undeserved, you can't earn it, buy it, or work for it. Free gift given at a costly price. Do you remember, we're going to show the next slide. Let me, we're going to show the next slide. Remember we said the old was transactional. The old is God came and created a new family to reach the old family, right? And he said, listen, here's what you do. If you obey, God blesses. And if we really took a look at the old, that's what all religion is. All religion is, is I obey, I appease, I pay God, I do something, and I do that so that God will bless me. And so if I jump through the religious hoops, then God blesses me, and I get a pass from pain. That is what the old is. Jesus didn't come to put a paint job on that. Jesus came to do something radically brand new, mind-blowing, something that was so scandalous, no one ever saw it coming. It's relational. In Jesus, God has blessed every single human being as much as God could. In Christ, you have an inheritance and a blessing that God can't love you or do any more for you. Anyone that would die for you is for you. It says in the scriptures, it says, but God demonstrates his own love for this. While we were still sinners, when we were still rebelling and rejecting and doing our worst thing, God sent his son to pay our price on a cross. God has blessed you as much as he possibly can. The new is God blesses us and then we obey or follow him, not because we have to, not because we earn it, because we trust in the God who saved us. That is a radical shift that we no longer get to earn it. Love paid a price that we could not. Well, Matt, let me get this right. You mean I could go out and like do something bad and then like just ask God to forgive me? And you mean he would forgive me because like Jesus paid the price? Yes. And this is where religion, this is what got Jesus crucified. The religious leaders were furious. Whoa, 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 whoa. No, no, no. People have to earn it. And Jesus is going, you can't earn it. You're already imperfect. No one can earn it. No one makes the grade. Only Jesus. Whoa, 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 whoa. Pastor Matt, are you saying that like, like that anyone can, can come to Christ? Yes. Do you mean they don't have to do anything for it? No. Jesus paid it all. It's Jesus and nothing. Whoa, 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 whoa. People could abuse the grace of God. Yes. That's what makes it scandalous. God knew that people would reject him. God knew that people would abuse it. God knew that religious people would use him to manipulate and exploit people. God knew all the bad and all the danger that would come with unconditional love. And you know what he did? He did it anyway. He chose to love us because of who he is, not because of who we are. Grace is a free gift, and here's what you're thinking. You're thinking, Pastor Matt, I've lived enough life. There is nothing free, and you are absolutely right. It is free, but it costs God his one and only son. You see, what's free to us costs God everything. Because for the only time in eternity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were separated. They were heartbroken. They were torn apart. There was separation as Christ took the penalty for all the sins of all the world, of all the people. My sins, your sins, our sins. The reason he could tell the thief on the cross, today you get to be with me in paradise, is not because he earned it, but because Jesus was paying the price so he could be free. So he could be brand new. Matter of fact, there was this religious guy. His name was Saul. And he hated this new way. Matter of fact, the church was called the way. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You no longer earn it through ritual and rules. It's a free gift given by God that costs him everything. And there was this guy named Saul, and he heard about these people, you know, helping other people and telling them they could be right with God without having to follow the rules. And he was so furious that he started persecuting Christians. He started putting them in jail. They even killed Christians. Except on the way, he encountered a risen Jesus. And this person who was a Pharisee and a rule follower and a ritual follower, all of a, all of a sudden, 
understood it was by grace. He planted a church and he wrote to a church in Rome that was a lot like this church. It was a church that some people grew up in church, some people with no faith and different faith. And we pick it up in Romans. Here's what he's right. He says, but now, see, it's brand new. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. You and I are not made right because we showed up today. We are not made right because we are perfect. No, 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 no. As was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. Well, how are we made right? We, nope, go, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus. Like, I just want to stop here. Listen, do not put your faith in me. I'm a flawed human being. I need the grace of Jesus. Do not put your faith in a building. Do not put your faith in an organization. Do not put your faith in politics. Do not put your faith in your grandma or your mama or your sister. Put your faith in the only person that's ever conquered hell and death. His name is Jesus. Put your faith in Jesus. And this is true for everyone. It doesn't matter the color of your skin, the amount of money, your education, your past, why you're here. Male, female, slave, free, woman, child, ethnicity. It doesn't matter. This is for. That's why at South Point we say everyone is loved and welcomed. Because this grace that you don't earn, is available to everyone. And it is true for everyone who believes, no matter who you are, you ought to be fired up. You mean I get to all the blessings and all the inheritance of the creator of the universe, and what do I have to do? Nothing. Sign me up. Sign me up for that one. All we have to do is do what the thief was. Admit that me mode is wrong. Admit that we're guilty. Admit that Jesus is the king who paid our price. And he goes on to say, the reason that all you have to do is put your faith in, the reason this is available, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short. There are no perfect people. This is why Christians, this is why people do not like us. Because we pretend that we're better than them and we're not. There are no perfect people. They're just forgiven people who actually didn't earn anything. It was a free gift. We're just beggars helping other beggars find the truth, which is Jesus. We all fall short of God's glorious standards. Yet God in his grace, what? What? Well, I, I'm so amazed. You mean God's going to forgive us and just wipe our slate clean? Yes. That's cray cray. It makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. And how did he free us? How was it free? Well, it says, God presented Jesus as a sacrifice. The penalty that I deserved for all the bad things and all the destructive decisions that I did to hurt people, and there were many of them, and all the things I did even after I began to follow Jesus, My aim, I think, has been right towards God. I have not executed that very well at times. But the reason that I get to be a child of God, the reason you get to be a child of God, the reason we get adopted back in the family is not because we earned it. It's because Jesus was a substitute. He paid our price. And when you and I understand grace, we will not want to abuse it because why in the world When there is someone that would die for you and pay everything for you and is for you more than your mama or your daddy or your grandma, loves you more than even you love you, is for you, why in the world would you ever want to abuse that? See, abusing grace never hurts God. It only hurts us. We can abuse God's grace all we want. It doesn't impact God. It may break his heart for us. But at the end, when we abuse God's grace, the only person that gets hurt is us. Which leads me directly into observation number three. It's God's unconditional love that has the power to transform us from the inside out. It is not law keeping that makes us better people. You know what law keeping makes us? It makes us hypocrites. It makes us judgmental. It makes us critical. When you and I try to keep the law and try to do rituals and rules, you know what that makes us do? We start judging everyone else for all the things that they're not doing what we're doing. And if I got to do it, they got to. It's not law keeping that changes us. It's unconditional love that has the power to transform us. I want to show you this next slide. See, when you and I, listen, listen, I get it. There are circumstances in our life that create pain and hurt. And I get it because I've experienced pain and hurt. But every once in a while, we have an opportunity to see through our pain, to see through our hurt, and see God for who he really is. He is good. Have you ever had bacon and chocolate? Mmm. I mean, have you ever heard the laughter of a baby? 
I mean, you ever seen a sunset or going to the beach or climbing the mountain? I mean, God is good. There's something in this life that when we look, we go, there is goodness out there. And we know there's goodness because when we see evil and brokenness, we go, that isn't it. There's a God who's good and is giving. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me just remind you. God gave humanity a whole planet. God gave humanity royalty. God gave humanity pleasure. It's his idea of sex. Taste buds are his idea. That's so awesome. And he's loving We've rejected him, we've rejected him, and we've stiff-armed him. And all God done has chased us and chased us and chased us. True example, I was talking to my adopted dad the other day. We were on a phone call. I forget why we were on a phone call. We were on a phone call for something else. But in the middle of phone calls, dad, I said something to my dad. I looked at my dad, and I couldn't look at him. I was talking to him. I said, dad. He goes, what? I said, I need to tell you something. He what? I said, dad, I just want to apologize. And he's like, what? Yes, I want to apologize. And he says, what for? I said, I was a horrible teenager. He's like, what are you talking about, son? I go, I, I just, I can't believe how horrible I was. Like, I treated you poorly. I used to have this chore list, and every time I didn't do a chore, I'd, I'd get charged $20. Some weeks, I just didn't care. I just paid $100 because I didn't do any of my chores. I said, I didn't listen to you. I was always giving you grief. And I said, now that I'm a dad, now that I'm a parent, I can see that you had my best interest at heart. You were trying to teach me how to be a good person, how to have, be a part of a family, how to not just be selfish, how to do things in life. Your goal wasn't to punish me. Your goal wasn't to keep me from having goal. Your goal was to help me experience life the best way I could. But I was too dumb to see it. And here's what I discovered. It's not like my dad changed. What changed was simply my view. And that's what happens when we realize God's unconditional love. It changes our view that God is out to squish us, that God is out to keep us from fun. No, no, no. He's a God who loves us. He's a God who's for us. He wants more good for you than you want for yourself. And it's love. I realized that in that moment, I had the ability to see how much my dad loved me. And if we could do that, see through our pain and our hurt, love will change us from the inside out. I love this scripture. We're going to put it up on the screen. It comes from 1 John. It says, God showed how much he loved us. And I just want to stop for a second. Because people talk about loving people and all these other things. Words don't mean anything. Actions do. And if the church could ever grab a hold of that, we'd be really good. God showed us how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world. He didn't send his son in the world to condemn the world. He didn't send his son in the world to make everyone feel bad, to beat him up with a bat. No, he sent him into the world that they might have eternal life through him. And then it goes on to say this. Next slide. This is real love. If you want to know what real love is, real love is not that we loved God, but that he loved us first. And he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice. When we can see that God is good and he is loving and that he is giving, something happens on the inside. I know for me, I had a bunch of habits that I didn't break right away. I don't want to lie to you. I don't want to tell you the next day after receiving Jesus that I was somehow perfect. And if you think I'm perfect now, you just get to know me. But I can tell you something happened when I said yes to Jesus. When I realized how much he loved me, I wanted to choose the aim of my heart to be something other than just Matt. To make God smile, to say thank you, to love him and to honor him. And the direction of my heart changed. And the reason why we have to go through this new way, this new way that Jesus brought that is so scandalous. It's something core to the message and I want to share it in this simple phrase. We can't live out Jesus' new command if we haven't received the new way Jesus brought. Remember way back in week one, we talked about the new that Jesus brought. Here it is. Here's the new that Jesus brought. We're going to put it up here. And now I give you what? A new command. Love one another as I loved you. Jesus doesn't say love one another the way you want to be loved. Don't love one another the way you think you should be loved. No, no, no. Love God, love others, and love your enemy the way Jesus did. And here's the truth. Whether you have no faith, different faith, or you're a follower, you cannot give what you do not have have. If you have not, if I have not received the unconditional love of God, I can't give the unconditional love of God. 
If you have not received the unconditional love of God, you can't give the unconditional love of God. If we haven't received the unconditional love of God, we as a community won't be able to give. The, we won't be able to do the very thing that Jesus says. It's not complex. It's not hard. We're going to get rid of all the rules. There's one rule. Love one another as Jesus did. And maybe we have such a hard time doing this because we're still trying to earn it. Because we actually haven't bought into the new way, which is there's nothing we can do. It's free. He gave his life for us, so we lay our lives down for him. He died for us, we lay our lives down because we trust him. So this morning I want to do something a little different. I'm going to close with a movie clip. And it's going to be from a movie that all of you know. It's from Frozen. So if we could hit the lights, and we're going to put it up on the screen. A couple days ago, my wife and I were talking as Christmas is coming around the corner, and she asked me this question. She goes, why do you think Frozen is one of the most popular Disney movies? Because I think there's a truth that all humans see in this movie. Where Anna and Elsa were at odds, where Anna had been rejected, and there was dysfunction in the relationship, and there was brokenness. But an act of true love, of sacrifice, melted her heart. And in a simple kid's story that is even true, we see a reality that every single one of us knows here today, that it is unconditional and true love that has the power to change our heart. And here's the amazing thing. In fictional stories, anyone can do that. But if we're really honest, there's only one who can give pure, unconditional love, and it is God. And that's exactly what Jesus did when he paid our price on the cross. And it leaves you and I asking an important question. Are we pursuing and trying to earn God's love? Or are we receiving God's unconditional love? Because one way will lead to you and I dressing up and putting on the costume of Christianity. The other leads to change from the inside out so that we can become the brand new people that we want to be. Let me pray. Hey, God, we're told that there's no sin that the blood of Jesus can't forgive. It is scandalous and ridiculous and mind-blowing. No matter what we've done, if we'll humble ourselves and admit that we got it wrong, and we receive you, our penalty is wiped away, that you welcome us home, not with strings attached, but as full sons and daughters who you love, that you can't love anymore. God, I pray that our hearts would be open, that we would not be trying to do the old way of earning it or working for it, but that we would openly handed lay down and surrender and receive your unconditional love so that our heart's aim might move off of chasing and being for me and aiming for you. We love you and we thank you. We choose today to say yes to your unconditional love. This is our prayer. And everyone who agreed said, amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.